What's going on? What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of the Successes Within Reach podcast, season three, episode three, diversity, inclusion, and equality in the workplace. One more time. Episode three, diversity, inclusion, and equality in the workplace. And once again, as some of you may notice, I have a guest who is no stranger here to the Successes Within Reach podcast, Miss Aisha Thomas. How are you doing, ma'am? Hey, hey, family. So glad to be back in the building. Appreciate you as always. Most definitely, most definitely. And happy new year to you. Happy new year. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we get started, I want to remind everyone you can join in the conversation and submit your questions and comments live at www.facebook.com slash SIWR podcast. And we will get them here on the air once again. Join in the conversation and submit your questions and comments at www.facebook.com slash SIWR podcast. All right. Uh, first things first, for those who may be new to the show, can you introduce yourself? Uh, tell us a little about yourself and um, how you chose a profession in the coaching and pro professional development industry. All right, family. Uh, I like to always start off and say I'm like your resident militarypreneur. So outside of serving in the uh, U.S. Air Force, a uh, shout out to the uh, Air Force uh, family and uh, those other military members out there that serve in the various branches. Huh. Um, I also support organizations, um, institutions in developing their leaders um, and within developing their leaders. Um, one of the things I highlight is diverse talent management, right? Because diversity looks, you know, it, it looks a certain way, right? Again, physically, um, there's generational diversity. Um, of course, you have, you know, the racial component. You have the aspect of um, the populations as women and so on. Um, so that diverse talent management has just extended in so many different ways where um, I've been supporting them through uh, the COVID crisis, right? Because that's shaped, that has shaken up organizations tremendously. So it's really... Um, supporting leaders, supporting their teams, navigate um, some really challenging times and really getting them to that level where they can get to that peak performance that they're looking in. So the blessing is I get to do that in the U.S. Air Force with my own team um, in my own organization. And also I extend that outside in supporting organizations, businesses and so on. So I love it. Hey, let's go. We work it over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for those that don't know, Ms. Thomas was our season one voted um, most appreciated, most loved guest that we had on uh, season one of the Successes Within Reach podcast. Every time she comes, she graces the stage, absolutely drops ridiculous value. People taking notes, watching the replays, sending messages like, hey, is she going to be on again? I didn't catch this. I didn't catch that. Leadership, management, diversity, inclusion. You want to take your staff to another level. This is the person you want to speak to. So make sure you definitely check her out um, on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, check out her podcast and check out her website as well. All right. So I want to start out. Um, a lot of people don't know the full difference between equity and equality. Um, both of those concepts are very, very important to a workplace um, and to a workforce, so to say. Uh, so can you tell them a little bit about the difference between each and why each is necessary to teach to your staff? Yeah, and I have these conversations all the time, right? Um, because, you know, we'll you utilize words and it's so important to understand um, all the different aspects. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the love. Right. So I'm um, even expanding it out. Right. So even when you think about diversity, I always ex uh, explain it's the uh, the faces, right? Mimicking the faces of society. So I love to use the example of New York. If anybody has been in New York, New York is so diverse. You can work walking down one block and you see like, hey, the Latin poppies, right? And then you go down one another block. What up, homie? Right? You walk down another block. It's the fashionistas. Hey, girl. Hey. And then you walk another block and it's like just total difference. And it's such a melting pot of just different backgrounds, ethnicities, and cultures. And then you get into the space where now you're talking about inclusion, right? And although you talked about equity and equality, I'm going to build up to that. Um, but again, these are the buzzwords that a lot of organizations and companies are talking about right now. But inclusion is now, am I included in the conversations? Is there um, when, and, and I'll use this example of um, Salesforce, and I love Mark Benioff, shout out because he's a CEO. Um, he had made a decision that when he has a meeting, 
um, I want to make sure that at least 30% of my meeting has female um, women representation. And the reason why is because he identified that there was a gap right? Because one of his women executives, they identify that, hey, we need to be included in the conversation. So this was the population in his company that said, hey, we aren't being represented. We're not getting our voice heard. So we need to be included. So inclusion is ensuring that all the voices are heard. Now let's go to equity. Equity is, do I have a seat at the table? Do you have a seat at the table for me, right? Is the system, the structure, the processes set up where if I wanted to get to the, the, the mountaintop, right? If I wanted to get to the decision-making table, and that's the key point, the decision-making table, the board of directors, whoever makes the big decisions of this company that moves and shapes um, how the company is affected, how it's going to support its companies, um, the internal customers, the employees and the external customers, those that are buying their products and services. Can I get there? Do you see my face there? Do you see women? Do you see people from this community and so on? So that is equity. And then equality is really when you think about equality, it has the word in there, equal, right? Equality is, is there a level of uh, equality in decision-making? Um, is there, say, you know, if you're saying that, okay, all of the staff are equally going to pay $5 for lunch, all of the staff are going to equally get this benefit, all of the staff are going to equally get X, Y, and Z. So there is a difference because, yes, you can have equality and say you're all going to get this. But then when you get to the decision making table of the people who are going to say who's going to get equality, nobody there looks like you. So it's important to have both. Right. Because, yes, you can say we are an equal opportunity. Right. We have equality. We have this representation. But then when it comes to the decision making table, there's no one there that looks like you. And it's so important. And I, and I think that's the biggest area that most companies, organizations and businesses are missing. They're missing equity. And once we start to have more equity and we see more diversity in those um, decision-making tables, that's when you have the magic because the more equity and the diversity you have in those rooms, the more you're able to touch and reach the internal customer, the employees, as well as the external customer, because again, now you're considering all the different um, perspectives. I think that's, that's such a key um, factor because so many people, like you said, a lot of things now just become buzzwords. And they're not really practicing it, you know, and just giving someone a seat at the table is not enough anymore. You know, there, there, there may have been a time where people just wanted a seat. But now people are like, well, no, not only do I want to sit at the table, but like you said, I want to make decisions also. I want to have a voice also. I want to make some rules also, you know, and, and a lot of companies, I think, are struggling with, OK, what do we do now? Because they were never made to, you know, allow equality and equity at the decision-making table. They were just comfortable with putting one or two people in there just to say, okay, hey, we met a quota. Well, that's not enough anymore. People are now standing up for themselves. People are now standing up for their demographic and they're saying, I know my worth, I know our worth. You're gonna give us a voice here as well, or we have to find somewhere else to go. Um, and I'm trying to think uh, another thing on that as well with equality and equity. I think it's key too when you start talking about um, employees that have disabilities as well. Um, you know, a lot of times equality and equity comes into play with do you have enough handicapped parking spots or do you have ramps for those that have wheelchairs? You know, are you making sure your elevators are always working at all times because you have people that can't take stairs? You know, so a lot of workplaces also have to understand it's not just about, you know, a, a particular demographic based on what a person um, identifies as or what they look like. You have, you know, discrimination that happens between those who have disabilities as well. You know, so that, that equity and equality piece goes all the way around the table and it encompasses every facet of your workforce and, and your staff. 
I love that you highlighted that because that that is big, right? And that's what um, my conversations about um, diversity, equity, inclusion have extended to, right? We've been talking about even generational diversity um, because one of the things I, I did an interview prior to this, we talked about ageism and there have been laws to protect um, individuals, typically 50 plus from navigating like at level, a level of age discrimination in the workplace. But now mm -hmm. you have 20 year olds and Gen Zers, right? Right? And they call them millennials, but it's like, I'm a millennial, so you ain't talking about me. Exactly. <laughs> you have Gen Zers that are now dealing with workplace bullying. They're dealing with um, um, workplace abuse. And they're dealing with the level of ageism like they never have. They, their level of poverty that they're navigating is even increasing because companies aren't hiring them um, and why that is. And this was just great information that I was talking to um, with the person I was talking to before, Stacey Harris, who has been in consulting consulting for about 30 years, but you know, when a company sees a resume and they see that Gen Zer and they've been at four jobs within the past few years, they're like, uh, uh, red flag, red flag. But what's happened is Gen Zers have seen the prior generation, their moms, their dads, their brothers, their sisters, navigate the workplace, stay loyal at companies that didn't treat them right. They saw them navigate the great recession. Um, um, they've seen them navigate you know, spaces that just did not, again, treat them right. And they're like, you know what? When I get a job, when I get into corporate, I am not going to be loyal to a company that does not do this, this, this. So they set standards and they're like, I'm bouncing. I'm leaving if this does not, um, this company doesn't uh, fit this pocket. So they'll leave as they should. But we have been conditioned and developed that you stick through it, you fight through it, right? And it's even our conditioning. So now they want to companies, here's my resume. And now they're being judged because of it, not realizing they actually, we can learn something from that. They've set a standard that you should not stay at a company that does not value you, that doesn't respect you, um, that doesn't, you know, treat you um, in a well manner. You should leave. And again, they're navigating like a whole nother level of ageism that is, um, you know, it's painful to hear. So we've had diversity and equity conversations and equality conversations about, you know, this generation that are going to be the future leaders and how companies and, you know, these baby boomers and these companies ran by, you know, the elders uh, to be more understanding and open to um, open the doors for these individuals. But yes, like when you think about these um, invisible quote unquote handicaps and they're not handicaps with people who are navigating a ton of different things that, um, you know, need support. We want to make sure that we are expanding our mindsets when it comes to equity and inclusion. And I think so um, solely from the racial aspect, which is extremely important, right? Because we want to make sure our people are getting the support, but we have individuals who are navigating disabilities that also need to be considered in that dynamic as well. Most definitely. And I, I think a lot of times people lose sight of the fact that regardless if a person is 20 or if they're 60, everyone still has something to contribute. You know, sure, people on one end of the spectrum may know how to do certain things a little faster uh, technologically because that's what they were born into. That's all they know. You know, where some of the other generations, it may take them a little bit longer to learn some of these things. But you have some 50, 60, 70 year olds that can run circles around people when it comes to typing and doing things on a computer as well. So, you know, employers need to understand you can't just completely count people out just because they may be older. The same as, like you said, you can't just not hire someone that's between 18 and 25 because you're like, oh, they're only going to be here 30 days and then they're going to leave. Well, maybe if you treated them better, they'd be here longer than 30 days. You know, I feel like they get such a bad rap for, oh, they're just job hopping. They're not, loyal, like you said, loyal to a company. They're not this, they're not that. This generation doesn't care about staying 20, 30 years, getting a go watching a certificate. <laughs> you know, they're about my rights, my respect, treat me like a human, treat me with some dignity and some decency and allow me to do my job. I don't need you standing over my back all day long. Just tell me what I need to do and get out of my way. You know, and, and there's so many people that are still, I feel like left from regimes of the past that feel like you have to stand over and crack the whip over people. And that, that just doesn't work anymore. <laughs> like it, it does not work with this generation anymore at all. Um, so I, I want to transition just a little bit um, and ask you, um, 
with so much, you know, being put on diversity and inclusion, how do you think that companies that are coming out the gate, a lot of the newer companies in today's world that are like, look, this is what we're doing. Everybody's included. Either get with it or get out the way. How do you think they're going to change the landscape of the workforce in, say, the next 10 to 20 years? Well, again, um, you know, go back a little bit with the Gen Zers, right? So the shift that's happening with this um, tide and these changes with the generation, you have a generation that it is the most diverse ever. So they're looking for companies and organizations to look like, again, mimic society, society look like, you know, these spaces that are diverse. So you do have a shift where there is a call and a need and a yearning for that to happen. Um, so a lot of companies are navigating, right? This, hmm, this, you, you have like more of like, I will say the opposite happening, but you do. Like you have a lot of younger companies and younger founders that are like, listen, let, we're open to this. Like we want this flow of uh, a different perspectives. And again, diversity looks uh, looks so much, right? It looks um, in different ways. So you have, you know, uh, different age groups, right? Different cultures, different backgrounds and so on. So you have these younger founders that are developing companies and they're again, adding that, uh, uh, that zhuzh to their companies. And then you have have those seasoned companies that have been around and, you know, they're, they're slowly <laughs> incorporating that diversity because again, you have to realize a lot of these companies are family based, right? Mm -hmm. It's mama and them, papa and them, and they want to pass that mantle on to their children. Um, and the beautiful, but the beautiful thing is they don't even realize that their children and, you know, that son that they're going to hand it down to, it's also on TikTok and I'm a savage. Yeah, like they doing yeah. all them dances and they're being exposed to, you know, a diverse mix of people. So you will see a tide and you will see an odd, you will, you, it's like you will see a change and a shift of companies that will essentially start looking different because that is just where the world is going. Mm -hmm. There's more blending that's happening. Things are just shifting towards that way. So I always tell individuals when it comes to when you work for a company, it's hard to tell them what they should do. Right. Mm -hmm. So even when you mention like put up or shut up, right. It's kind of like when you work for someone if they come out with a policy and they're saying, okay, this is how the culture is going to be. This is how we're shifting. And this is the look of the company. And maybe you have individuals within it. It's like, no, I like, I like how it looks right now. Unfortunately, if it's ran by a board or if it's ran by individuals that wanted to look that way, they pretty much have the say. Um, and essentially, What's going to be important for them is to like, again, live by what they're saying, meaning that they'll have to hold those people responsible. They'll have to pivot those individuals, even if it means out the door, if they don't want to maintain that type of culture. Because what you don't want is to put out these hashtag and these messages and say, oh, hashtag, we're about diversity, equity and inclusion and hashtag we're about this or put out these messages. And the reality is you're not really about that life because that's the other thing that individuals are really looking for. They're really saying like, oh, so you put out a diversity statement or this statement out there. They're saying that you're making this pivot. But when I still look at your board, I don't see that you've made any changes. Mm -hmm. So you really aren't about that life. So that is another verification piece. So leaders, organizations, be ready to answer questions about diversity. Be, be ready to answer questions about what you put out there. And I want to challenge those out there that are looking for positions or looking for organizations to be more diverse to start to, again, look at opportunities at, as I, um, I, and I said this before about not going into roles as, or opportunities as, you know, choose me, but I choose you. And you want to also use that opportunity at the end. Hey, do you have any questions for us? Yes. Um, I see, you know, in um, 20, uh, what was it? Two, two, uh, early 2021, 2021, you said that you uh, were going to da, 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 right? Um, how do you plan on moving forward in incorporating more equity within your leadership, uh, your leadership chain? Uh, uh huh. Uh, well, what had happened was, um, we did, we were going to hire somebody, and, um, right. Uh -huh. So, 
again, it, it is something that is needed, wanted um, more. The next generation is looking for a corporate social justice, more companies to have that blend. And if they don't, my light just went off, but if they don't, um, you're not going to be as attractive. So now you're going to start to navigate a retention and a recruitment issue. So it is going to be a need and a want. And one last thing is, if your future leaders are going to be, look, if they're going to want diversity, so will your future clients. So you need to also consider that, right? Your future clients are going to change. They're going to want diversity. And so will your future leaders. So you want to start to consider that now. So yes, it will be a need and a want for both sides. Oh man. I, I think that was so awesome. That, that question that you just posed, like, I want everybody that's watching this podcast, that's going to watch the replay, listening to it, streaming, whatever. From now on, when you go on an interview, and I don't care what your demographic is, I, when they say, do you have any questions for us? I want you to start asking at least one diversity, inclusion, and e equity or equality question. And just and the looks on their faces will tell you all you need to know about that company. If they have a ready-made statement, and it sounds rehearsed already, you might want to look into that. If they look at you and everybody got the puzzle face and the deer in the headlights look, you might want to think about that before accepting that position, unless you're applying for a position to be the person to create said change. You know, But if that sparks a meaningful conversation, that may be a company you want to look into. You know, But the, the ones that just stone face you, like you, you just called them out their name because you mentioned diversity and inclusion, you might not want to work there. <laughs> you might not want. Yeah, I remember work. that red flag challenge or whatever they had. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh man! Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Successes with Their Reach podcast, season three, episode three: Diversity, Inclusion, and Equality in the Workplace. We have come to our first break. We'll be right back. This break is brought to you by the CEO within. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Once again, I'm your host, Shannon Smith, and I'm joined for this episode by Miss Aisha Thomas as we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equality in the workplace. Uh, so I want to play this clip that I saw and get your thoughts on it, um, where this woman talks about um, toxicity in the workplace. And if you, know, you see these certain things where you work, it may be time for you to think about going somewhere else. Uh, so I want to play this clip right quick. Five signs your workplace is toxic. First sign, any isms present. Racism, sexism, ageism, any discrimination in any form allowed to run rampant, toxic. Second sign, poor leadership. I did a whole video on insecure bosses, check that one out. Whether they're insecure, abusive, incompetent, it's a problem, toxic environment. Third sign of a toxic environment, you're overworked. Where's the work-life balance? There isn't any, it's all about the company. Forget about your weekends, forget about your life. It's all about them, toxic. Fourth sign is that the morale is low. People are dragging themselves into work and watching the clock for when it's time to leave. And in between, they can't create. They're not inspired, they're not motivated because the environment is toxic. And the fifth sign is that you're sick. Everybody's sick, accounting, marketing, everyone. Sick because the company is making them sick. If this is you, it's time to go. All right. So what are your thoughts on that? Wow. Uh, that, that was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot, um, but it was good. Right. I, and I want to actually highlight something, right? Because there was a piece on there that I was like, is within our control because all of it is within our control, right? Because of course, um, when we've identified, we are within a workplace that is, unhealthy, it's time to transition. So I love it, right? That that first aspect, any type of ism, you want to transition. And one of the things, like I always have this quote where I says, individuals don't typically quit the organization, they typically quit the leader. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want to highlight with the isms is where is that ism coming from? Is it an individual? Is it the culture? Is, the, is it the entire structure 
of the organization. The beautiful thing about organizations and companies now, there's a website called Glassdoor. Check out glassdoor.com. It's a great thing now. You can go on there and it talks all the mess about these companies. You can literally go on there and research the background, the insides and outs of companies, individuals that's left, right? So that's a great thing. You can go now go online and um, get some intel about companies. So that's great. And um, also, again, if you can connect with people who have worked there, you can kind of get a taste of the culture. However, again, when you are dealing with these isms, is it coming from the individual, an individual leader? Because it is the reality. Studies have shown that it could be that one person that is quote unquote toxic or unhealthy that will result to you leaving. But the reason why I want to highlight that because I want to challenge And I've experienced this myself. I want to challenge those out there. If you are navigating with a leader and you say, you know what? It's not the entire organization. It's that one person. Are you willing to say something, right? And that's the hard part. That's that part of the journey of um, navigating um, leadership or navigating working for an organization is holding someone accountable because It literally could be just one person that needs to be held accountable and needs to be escalated. And by that person getting rooted and booted up out of there, that could change the entire dynamic of that organization. And I've had to have those tough conversations. I've had to file complaints. And again, I've done it within the military structure, which can be really complicated. Um, And I've also have have done it in the the civilian sector. I've done it in school. Um, So that's one thing. Again, just really identifying where is that ism? Is it structural? Is it within the ecosystem of that company or if it's, if it's that one individual, is this something that I can address, get this person out, up out of there or get it addressed? Um, and again, if it's not addressed, right, and that's the other thing, when you bring it to the awareness of HR or to to whatever reporting system that they have in place and they don't address it, you definitely want to get up, get, um, get up out of there because, again, that's where a lot of companies have breakdowns. They say we're about this. We're going to protect you. We're going to make sure that you feel safe. Because again, it's about the safety of your team members. You can create unsafe environments for your team members, for individuals who support you when you don't protect them, when they come to you and say, I'm dealing with sexism, racism, I'm dealing with workplace bullying, and you don't do anything about it. Bounce, all right? They're not going to protect you and make you safe. There are individuals who will deal with um, emotional abuse, literally get um, and end up with anxiety and stress because of the workplace. It is not worth it. Leave. So that's one thing. Overworked. Um, mentioned uh, being over, I'm sorry, poor leadership, right? Again, poor leadership. Is it an individual? Is it the entire ecosystem? Overworked. Now, once we got here, I was like, is this something that we can control? Mm -hmm. Because work-life balance, is it the organization forcing you to work beyond, right? Or is it boundary-based? Is it people pleasing? Is this some personal development and growth that I need, right? And we've talked about assessments and the DISC and all these different psychometric assessments out there. But some of us have tendencies, right, to, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'm going through this season right now. My word for the year is boundaries, right? Because I'm a natural high performer. And you guys might be like, that's great. It's not, right? Because I have children. I'm um, fine. I'm finishing up my master's program. Um, I have a business. I serve in the United States source full time. It's not part time, full time. Right. Um, I contract for other companies. Uh, I have, you know, coaching clients. I do all of that. And people be like, oh, my gosh, girl, you rock. You doing all those things. And I'm like, uh, but, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I won't, you know, I, I need to have balance for myself, right? I'm in these dating yeah. streets, you know, I, I want a boo thing. I got to think if I'm going to partner with someone, I have to make time for them. So I have to have boundaries. I can't just be working all the time. If I want to be, you know, mingling and meeting, you know, my debonair man in the future. So I really have to think about these things or I'm telling all my business. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but that's the reality, right? So I want you to ask yourself, is it the company like forcing my hand to work? Or again, is this something that I can control? And now I just have to develop boundaries and create those. And that's the beautiful thing that these Gen Zers are teaching us is boundaries. They're taking their leave. They're saying, nope, 
I'm taking off for the rest of the day. I will not do that. This is my job description. I'm just going to do that. Have a good day. Um, but what's driving your high performance? What's driving you to say yes? What's driving you not to have boundaries? Is that something that requires some work, um, so, excuse me, some internal work um, and some personal development? So that's why I was saying like there's some areas where it's control based because the reason why when she mentioned mentally sick, emotionally sick, low morale, is it tied to those things that is within your, in, excuse me, with in your control, um, but realizing that any environment that is toxic, unhealthy, it is within our control and there's nothing keeping us there. So always consider how can I ensure that I have an exit plan, start working that exit plan and transition, but things that you can control, work on those areas and also do those self checks because a lot of the things that we have unfortunately created, um, or, um, Sometimes we go and we blame the organization and the company and it's just like, no, it's just my lack of boundaries and my lack of boundaries is because I didn't learn boundaries as a child. And it's because I saw that from my mama, like it's literally therapy. Right. And mm -hmm. again, you're talking about somebody that had to work through that stuff and had to learn how to say, no, I won't do it. Have a good day. All right. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had a lot of the same thoughts when I when I first saw it. You know, I was like, yeah, a, a lot of these isms are horrible in the workplace if it gets out of control and no one ever checks it, you know. And I, I think what you were saying was key. Like, are these things within the infrastructure of the company or is it just one supervisor or is it just the one person on the staff that likes keeping nonsense going for, for lack of words? You know, we, we all have worked with those people that their whole life is unhappy, so they bring it to work and they want to keep the gossip and the rumor mills going and they just keep nonsense going on at work. Has anyone said anything to them? You know, have you ever pulled that supervisor to the side and say, hey, man, look, I understand you, you're over the top of this section or over the top of the department, whatever the case may be, but the way you talk to people is out of bounds, you know, or the way you screamed at such and such in a meeting that was completely out of pocket. Like a lot of us didn't appreciate that, so I know they didn't appreciate that. Sometimes people know that they're being an idiot and they're fine with that. But then sometimes you have to remember that people are human and they may have messed up in that moment. They may have had a toxic moment, but they're not a toxic person. You know, I think sometimes we just completely categorize people incorrectly because of one or two actions or one or two interactions rather. Um, however, if this is this person's day to day behavior, Oh, then yeah, you, you got a decision to make. Either report them, you're going to deal with it, or it's time to roll up out of there. Um, but uh, one ism I wanted to ask you about that she didn't mention, and I, I know a lot of people deal with it depending on what industry they're in, uh, definitely in the family businesses. What about nepotism? Like, what, Lord. Because <laughs> that, that's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> My goodness. And you know what, before we even get into nepotism, right? Um, Cause you, you mentioned something um, early. I'm trying to remember what you said. Oh yes. You were saying like these words, right. Um, that we use, right. Because I do think they're words that are overused. Um, and I think that, you know, it's funny. Cause wh who was it? Was it, was it Mike that said people use, um, there was one word that he said, I'm tired of hearing this one word. Was it, I forgot what it was, but there's certain words that we use and we've connect, like for instance, narcissism. I've heard that so much. And I'm just like, are we taking like to toxicity? Um, are we saying, are we like attributing or connecting or automatically saying this person is toxic or this person is this, we want to start really be, um, we need to start, um, being mindful of categorizing things, right? And making sure that we are really clear and making sure we're analyzing the situ situation before we start automatically saying, boom, this is what it is, right? Because again, there are certain terms that have just become buzzwords. They've just become popular and it might be literally what it is. It might be, yes, this is a toxic environment, right? Or this person is toxic, but again, it could literally just be like you mentioned, like it might, it might just be a moment and, and by no means are me or Shannon like downplaying what anyone is navigating because I've been, I've been in a workplace to a point where I had suicidal ideations, right? I have been in spaces where, you know, I have escalated the matter all the way up to the, I feel like to the president of the United States. Right. And it's like, y'all, y'all really ain't going to do nothing. 
Are y'all gonna mm-hmm. call me and say, well, maybe you shouldn't have done that. Excuse me? Aren't you supposed to be advocating for me? I've yeah. been to the point where I'm just like, you know what? But my entire career, I'm ready to bounce out. Forget this. I don't even care how many years I've been in. I have been there. Um, but the reality is, is um, there are moments where I'm like, you know what? I have been able to control this matter or I needed, I, maybe I could have um, navigated this, get, excuse me, navigated it like this. So again, I love what you highlighted. Like, let's be mindful of these terms and these words that we use because it's like, um, is it really that or is it something else? And I just need to really uncover what it really is, have those conversations, address it. Because the reality is a lot of people will watch somebody uh, practice or, or be a sexist in the workplace for years. And you the first person in the environment, like y'all be helping. Oh, that's just how so-and-so is. Ha 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 ha. And it's like, this is not okay. At or all. this person is just rude. Like why are they just so, why are they talk? How did you even get hired? Oh, that's just so, and they got a bonus. How did they get a bonus? how and they got the time off and the bonus you know and they've never said anything and you're the first person because maybe you're healed you're whole and 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 all that and you're like this isn't normal and that and, and i'll leave this one note before we get into nepotism is um that's a big factor right there are a lot of people who are in these workplaces and we're carrying our worldviews and our experiences into the workplace. And we're not even realized that the toxicity or all these isms that we haven't addressed is because it's normalized. We've experienced it all our life. We've seen it on the block. We've seen it in the home. We've seen it in relationships. So when we're in the workplace, we don't address it because unconsciously, This is what we've experienced most of our life. Again, like I talked about boundaries, you've never seen boundaries maintained in the home. So you don't have them in the workplace. And and that's the interesting part. That's why I do a lot of um, introspective. I call it introspective development is because I really have leaders look at themselves from when they were children all the way up until now. And I say, this is why you lead this way is because you have to realize your first teachers, right? Which are your parents or whoever raised you. You have to realize your trauma, all of that stuff follows you into your leadership role or into the workplace. And now this is the first time that someone is like, who are you talking to? Oh, that ain't normal, right? Especially if somebody that has been doing internal work and they're Mm -hmm. like, you ain't supposed to be talking like that. What you mean? That's how all of them talk. Well, that's what you heard everybody talk like in the home. But this is not okay. We gonna teach and learn respect in the workplace. So it's so interesting how as a leader, Or how has somebody that works in a team, the first time someone is hearing about boundaries, respect, is in a workplace and they're a whole grown person. Um, So we do have to realize that that is a reality that is happening. And that's why a lot of these workplaces are like this. And it's happened for so long because for many of us, we have lived this in our communities or in our homes and we're in the workplace now and it's normalized. And now someone that's healed and whole is like, this ain't normal. What are y'all doing? <laughs> Can we address yeah. this? So ASAP. I highlighted that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So nepotism, right? We're going to get into nepotism. All right. So I'm going to d- define it for some people because some people are like, what? what is nepotism, right? So again, the definition, right, is the practice among those with power and influence, right, of favoring rel- relatives or friends, especially by giving them jobs. Whew. So, hmm. again, so like what we were talking about earlier, there are a lot of companies that are built and developed with the mindset of legacy. And think about it for for a lot of us, we're in the we are in a lot of communities and spaces where what are they saying? They're about it's about legacy building. Mm-hmm. So, I see I see a couple sides of it, right? Because we are and we should be um, building empires, companies, and businesses with the idea in mind of, you know what, I want to build something that can live on, I can pass on to my children and so on. However, it's the other side of, are you equipping, developing, and preparing those individuals that are going to take it on 
to ensure that they are managing those areas that they're place, placing them in or handing over that role of responsibility that they're going to do it effectively. So I feel like it'll be contradictory, like co contradictory to say, okay, we shouldn't practice that, right? We should be like, let's get away from that. Because again, it's like, that's what legacy building is all about. But what, what happens a lot of times is, oh, I'm going to pass it on to my son or my daughter or whomever. And they're not really equipped. They're not ready. They're not, um, they haven't been developed effectively. They haven't really done the work and they're being handed something that is so um, important or something that's so sensitive because I always tell people like every decision we make doesn't just affect um, you, it affects everyone else within that ecosystem. So it affects the employees. And if it affects the employees, it's affecting their household, it's affecting the wife, the daughter, the son, whoever's attached to that person. So when you're handing it down to your daughter or your son, because yes, I'm so happy to hand it down, but they're not equipped. You have to realize that there's so many other people attached, the internal customer, again, your employees, the external customer, your customers who love your products and services. And if they're not prepared for it, um, you'll be doing them a disservice as well. So I see the benefit for legacy building, but are they prepared? And if they are not, do not hand it down to your relatives or friends because um, you'll be doing a disservice to people who truly are there, um, you know, to help build your uh, mission and vision. Most definitely. I, I think it's it's such a fine line, I think, to, to walk on when it comes to that because just the, the word nepotism has such a negative connotation to it. But like you said, some people view it as legacy building. You know, I, I work 40, 50, 60 years building this company. I want to make sure my family is always in a good position. I want to leave this to my kids. They can pass it on to grandkids, whatever, whatever. But like you said, are they ready to take the keys yet? Are, are they ready to take the wheel yet? Um, because as a boss as a lot of people like using the term if if you are really a, a boss you are the ceo you are the owner of the company you have to understand you are responsible for the roof over the head of every single family that you employ you are responsible for the food on the table for every single employee that you have so I understand you want to pass it on to your kids and then your grandkids someday and whatever the case may be. If that's what you want to do, start making them earn it. Don't just give them a, a VP title and have them sitting there with the feet kicked up on the desk on TikTok all day long and they're not learning the ins and outs of the company. And then you hand it over to them, all of the employees quit, and five years later, the company is going bankrupt. You just did 30, 40 years worth of work for absolutely nothing, you know, or like I said, half your workforce quits. And now all of a sudden you're, you know, ha having trash articles and Forbes and Newsweek and all of these publications because people are like, dude, this was the absolute best place to work. Such and such gave it to their son or their daughter. And now it's, it has to be one of the top 50 worst places in America to work. That's not the type of legacy you want to leave behind. And sometimes you have to set your ego to the side and be honest with yourself. Is my son, is my daughter, is my brother, is my sister, whatever the case may be, are they truly ready to put in the work that I put in to build said business, said organization, said nonprofit, whatever the case may be? And if they aren't, they got to wait. They got to get in line. You, you know, you have to make that tough decision and let them know, hey, I don't feel you're ready yet. This is what I need you to do before I can hand you the keys to the kingdom. If you're not willing to do that, you can stay where you are and such and such in whatever department is ready to move up. Because one way or another, this is my exit strategy and I'm on my way out the door. Are you going to show me that you're going to earn it? Otherwise, you kind of slide from the legacy building side to the nepotism side. You know, because like I said, it, it depends on how you look at it, but most of the time it has a negative connotation because you just gave it to someone because you're related to them, not that they actually earned it, you know, and I, I feel like a lot of people get caught up in that. And it, like I said, you work your butt off day in and day out, building a business, building a nonprofit, building an organization. You want it to be here 100, 200, 300 years after you're dead and gone. 
you got to think about that when you pass the keys on. You know, make your kids earn it. Don't just give it to them just because they're your kids. That's that's not your job to give them everything. They're adults now. Make them earn it. You know, one of the best things I saw recently, Shaq just did an interview where people were laughing because he said one of his kids uh, asked for some kind of vehicle. And he was like, so how are you paying for it? And they were like, what you mean how I'm paying for it? We rich. And he was like, we? Who is we? <laughs> you know, he was we like, speaking French now? <laughs> exactly. You know, he was like, how many baskets you scored? How many endorsements do you have? You know, how, how many 82 game seasons have you played? He was like, no, I'm rich. I don't know about you. <laughs> you better go to college and, and earn it, you know. So, it, you know, and Kevin O'Leary says the same thing. Uh, the guy from Shark Tank, I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with him. But he said when they travel, he and his wife are in first class. His kids are in coach. You know, he was like, y'all haven't earned anything. We we worked for first class. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> you know, So you have to get in a habit of making people have the same work, work ethic that you had to be successful and to really achieve greatness before you give them the keys to the kingdom. That is so, so, so important for any company, any organization. I cannot stress that enough. Um, so I want to one more ism um, that was touched on in the video and you spoke about it briefly, too, um, is sexism. Um, and along with that is chauvinism in the workplace. And, you know, a lot of women look, you know, for men to help them out. They're like, OK, I know you heard what such and such just said. Are you just going to stand there and let them say that? But some guys, sure, they don't mind calling whoever out, but they don't know what the next step is or they don't know what a lot of women are really looking for, for them to do as an ally in the workplace uh, to help eradicate sexism and chauvinism. So can you give some insight as to how men can be better coworkers and allies, not necessarily um, trying to jump in and be Superman, Batman, and, and play the superhero role, but to actually work side by side with the ladies in their workplace to help like I said, eradicate the sexism and chauvinism and harassment. I love this question. Um, I, I had a, we were, you know, me, when I say we, me and me and some friends were having this conversation and this even came up on the show because you had this dynamic where um, on certain like shows that we watch, um, it, it, there was an incident where, um, you know, a male was like getting really aggressive with a, a female and, you know, they, responded a certain way, but when it was the other side, right, they didn't respond. And it really created this dialogue about, you know, ensuring that men on the other side are getting that level of support. And it's like, keep the same energy, right? Making sure that um, women are held accountable as well when they exude the same type of behavior. So um, this also created this dialogue of, okay, same thing. Okay. When a man sees like, you know, um, another man, uh, responding a certain way or talking to a certain a woman a certain way. How do you respond? Like, I need you to hold them accountable. Like, you know, you have these, uh, you know, of course, like protect the black woman, uh, making sure that you are supporting us and goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's not, again, it's not an excuse, but there are a lot of men and there are a lot of individuals out there that are like, I don't know what to do. Right. I need to know what, you know, they always have this joke, joke, like, you know, I've seen these memes all the time. Like, you know, uh, I don't know how to make a woman happy. Like if I breathe, she's, she, I don't know. She's happy. If I don't breathe, she's not happy. If I eat, she ain't happy. If I don't eat, like, it's just like all these up and ups and down, but it's reality that, you know, there are men out there navigating and they're wondering, how do I support you? Can you help me understand what does support look like. And I think that it is important for us to have those conversations and be specific and say, okay, this is what we need. And it's really accountability. It's conversation. It's, hey, if uh, if someone is being rude or disrespectful, it's disrespectful, it's, can you say something to them? But also recognizing that conflict and um, conflict resolution between men. And again, I don't want to speak for men. And I, I would love for your insight to be on in this because I don't want to speak for the man because I hear conversations and thank God I have male friends and I can hear this conversation. But it's this idea of how are men taught to handle conflict, right? 
And in this great dialogue I hear between men, they were like, listen, we know that if we address certain men, we know we got to put the pause on each other. We know it's automatically going to escalate because that's how they have learned to address conflict. So they really pay attention and they watch for more physicality to happen before they jump in. So if mm -hmm. it's a word exchange, they were like, listen, we're less likely to, to um, maybe get involved because it's like, okay, it's a word exchange. But if they see like it's, it's progressing to physicality, okay, we're, they're more likely to get involved because they know the likelihood of a fight happening is more likely between males because that's what conflict resolution looks like within that party because that is unfortunately, right, the um, common result of conflict. So it's really, and again, I would love for you to chime in, it's really like addressing that piece of, and it's a bigger thing, right? How can we, even behind that, start looking to supporting even, I'm a mom, I have a son, teaching him how to deal with conflict without thinking, when it comes to two men, it has to be physicality. It has to be aggressive versus let's talk it out, bro. How can we talk about it? And I can be like, that's disrespectful. Like you don't do that. And it doesn't turn into a fight versus like, all right, let me sit back. He might cuss her out a couple bit, but that's all right. Because I know if I get in, it's going to be a fight. So what is your perspective on that real quick before I continue? Because that is the common theme I've heard between men. It's like, I, if I jump in, I know I'm going to fight. And if I fight, I have to think about if I have a spouse, if I have a daughter, if I have a child, if this is the work environment, if this is a fight, am I going to lose my job? There are all these thoughts that happen and that's why sometimes they don't say anything and I know you might be like that doesn't vibe with me but that is literally the conversations I've had um what is on the line if I interject because I know the likelihood of a fight is going to happen it's, it's going to happen um so I, I think it's, it's such a multifaceted uh question you know because a lot of times it's situational um, based on the environment that you're in. You know, um, I think a lot of guys have one perspective if they see, a, you know, say a, a man disrespecting a woman in the workplace versus if it's in a bar or if it's on the subway or, you know, completely different, of course, say if it's at a family function, you know, so a lot of times guys are trying to assess, you know, like you said, how much am I willing to risk based on how far this may go? Um, and then another part of that as well is there are situations where a guy steps in and then they get completely berated because they're like, I was just trying to help, you know, the situation didn't look right. He shouldn't be talking to you like that. And now you're screaming at me saying, you know, I can take up for myself. I didn't ask you to jump in. I don't need you to be Superman. I can handle myself, you know, yada, yada, yada. So it's like, okay, well, dang, I, <laughs> I was just trying to help out and, and do what I was raised to do and, and what I felt like was right. And each of those things, it helps, unfortunately, to shape how guys react the next time they, you know, have that type of encounter. Um, I think overall, like you said, most guys have the, zero tolerance point, which is usually the physicality part. You know, they're like, all right, if they're arguing, I don't know if they're brother and sister. I don't know if they're cousins. I don't know if they're dating, but they're just arguing. If it turns into a domestic situation, all right, I got to step in. Like, I'm, I'm not going to just let this woman be assaulted. Um, in the case of the workplace, a lot of times it depends on who the guy is that is committing the offense as to how a lot of guys will handle it. You have some that are like, wrong is wrong. I don't care if you're the CEO or, or you're the day one trainee. You're not going to you know, conduct yourself like that with the ladies in the workplace. And then you have some that are like, well, if I say something, he might fire me. Or if I say something, I'm not going to get that promotion that I'm supposed to be getting. And, you know, I don't really get down with such and such anyway, you know, they don't really talk to me or every time I try to help, they bite my head off and stuff like that. And I'm like, are you serious? It's a concept of right and wrong, not a tit for tat type of thing, you know? And unfortunately some people have the, 
a juvenile mentality of they're not my friend, so I'm not going to help out. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. You know, I don't talk with them. I don't eat lunch with them. I don't, you know, get on any projects with them at work. So I'll let them fend for themselves. And then, like I say, you have some guys, they're like, nah, right is right. Wrong is wrong. Like, fam, you don't, you know, talk to the ladies um, in a chauvinistic way. You don't sexually harass them. We don't do that here. You got to find somewhere else to go. If she reports and write it up, I'm going to be right there helping her write it up. And I'm willing to testify, you know, against you in, in front of HR. So I, I, it's, it's a case by case basis. Some guys, I hate to say it, some are just built like that to where, like I said, right is right, wrong is wrong. And then you have some, it's going to be situational. And then unfortunately for some ladies out in the street, you have some guys that don't jump in because they can't fight. <laughs> you know, some guys are, are horrified. If I step in and help this lady out and then it does turn into a physical altercation, I end up with a stake on my eye. Then what? <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's it's so many different factors that go into it. Um, and it's unfortunate for a lot of a lot of ladies that get caught up in said situations, because, like I said, for me, I feel like it's just a matter of right and wrong. Um, but you have some guys that they they it's almost, you know, my wife laughs all the time. I talk about the sports center bar like guys are just geared like that because we watch ESPN all the time. But situations happen. And and you could just see it in our mind. It's like that little bar at the bottom of ESPN on Sports Center. Like we got so much stuff with all of the what ifs that are going through our head. Like, okay, if this happens, then what if this? And if that happens, what if that? And then some of us we just jump into action and it's like, all right, now it's just not going down like that in front of me. And I love that. And and it was important for that share to happen because I think it's important that women understand all these different thoughts that are happening right and it's good to, it's good to know this because it's like okay we know it's maybe a culture thing it might be hey you know you grew up here and like mind your business you know there's an aspect of man i can't even fight i don't even know what to say if this does escalate i might get hurt all these different things that are nav they're navigating so there is a level of, yes, again, I understand 100 percent. Right. And again, and, and we want to be protected. We want to, you know, that that knight in shine, shining armor to run in and um, step in. But the reality is that doesn't happen all the time. Um, but for um, the men out there, one of the things that um, I've done and trained on is bystander prevention. This was ma mainly for on the side of um, sexual assault and prevention and for interpersonal um, personal violence, um, which I do uh, for the Air Force. We do, um, I'm like an interpersonal violence, uh, violence prevention coordinator. So we do these facilitations. So we talk about bystander prevention and we give different tactics of of preventing or engaging in something that might look a little shady, but you want to find the approach that works best for you, right? So there's a direct approach. So Shannon talked about like, I don't like that. What's up? I don't like what's what's going on. What's going on here? I don't like what's going on. You're yelling at her and you want to, you know, again, interject and ask that question. If that is the approach you prefer. There's another approach, right? There is a distraction tactic, right? So there is an option where, you know what? I don't feel as comfortable, but is there a way I can distract the situation from happening? You might be like, that's not as favorable. But again, if that's what makes that person comfortable and that maybe is a way to distract the matter and then get that person away, it could be literally they knock something down or pull a fire alarm. And I know that might be extreme, but this is just, again, a distraction tactic. Somebody might spill a drink, like say if it was at a bar or somebody walks in in, in um throws up some papers, whatever, but there are some people who um, have distraction. Uh, you can tap into a distraction tactic to kind of distract the situation from happening. And I don't know, and find a way to kind of like pivot what's happening in that moment to kind of like bring attention to, okay, let's get this person out of here. Um, then you have the option of, Hey, let me call. I really don't want to get involved. Cause I know I don't have any, uh, I know I played, you know, Mike Tyson kick was it the little Mike Tyson game they had back in the day? I played, oh, Tekken. Punch out. <laughs> you punch out. I played, I got, I'm, I'm good with these video games, but I have no hands. Okay. Do, do, do. HR, uh, 
Mike acting up again, and uh, he's talking to Susan really disrespectful right now. And I think somebody needs to come down right now and say something. That is another option, right? So that's another option. So although we, ladies, I know we want everybody to have the direct approach, but the reality is with the examples we heard, not everybody feels comfortable. It might be, again, cultural. It might be uncomfortability. It might be a multitude of different things. But this, these are ways that we have equipped bystanders to approach or um, navigate if they're seeing signs of interpersonal violence. If we've seen cases where they see somebody pop a molly in a drink or they see something that's like, mm, I don't know if that is... Um, you know, brother and sister or whatever, but they find different ways to um, possibly intervene that maybe, okay, I'm going to pass it on to someone else. Tell the bartender, hey, can you go, hey, uh, something's going on over there. I don't know what it is, but hey, pass it on to someone else. So those are different tactics and ways that um, gentlemen can interject um, based off of their style, what makes them comfortable, and they still have done something versus just saying, I'm going to stay silent. So, and that has worked really well because by equipping um, different individuals within um, the military component and um, the sister services of these approaches, it's really helped in them knowing like, okay, I don't feel comfortable doing the direct approach, but at least I can call someone, I can distract, I can pass it on to someone and say, hey, I don't know what's going on over there, but I know Shannon, he's a direct one. So Shannon can go over and say something. Okay, all right. And now they feel fulfilled because they've done something. So, you know, I want to say let's let's give our fellas a, a bit a little bit of grace because the reality is is that they are navigating all of that, and you do have some individuals who will flip out if they are approached directly because of the state they're in. And and I can say, you know, also with the, the one scenario that I gave, I I've actually heard some guys say that they completely got their head chewed off, so they just completely stand off you know, in certain situations now. Understand some guys, <clears throat> when they come in to assist, it's not that they're saying that you're weaker or that you can't handle yourself or that you're less than. Just understand some guys were raised that way to assist when you see a lady in danger or when you see one being harassed or, you know, spoken to less than. It's not that he's saying you couldn't handle yourself. That's just the way he is. He was he was trying to help out and like I said to assist, not necessarily trying to be Superman and take over the whole day, but you know, don't don't necessarily bite everyone's head off and take it that they could automatically withstand that you were weaker. Some guys just have a very low tolerance for the nonsense and they see you being disrespected and they're like, no, we're gonna dead that right now, you know. And and another situation too, um, especially when you're out and about and I, I need more guys to start doing this in the workplace, there's strength in numbers. You know, back in the day, you, you could be out in the neighborhood, somebody from another neighborhood come around and they disrespect one of the ladies on the street. You have every dude on that street out there like, no, nah, we don't do that around here. We, we protect our own. We're not going for that. Go back where you came from. Guys, I need you to understand in the workplace, you may feel like as one person, I can't change this because the person that is showing the toxic traits may be a supervisor or, or an administrator, or whatever the case may be. But if all of the fellas in there are saying, look, we're not going for this. It's no longer one anymore. Now it's six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of y'all going up to such and such and saying, look, the way you've been talking to the ladies here, the way you handle such and such in our last staff meeting, the comments that you made when such and such were addressed the other day, we, we're not going for that. We don't do that here. You may be new here, or you may have even been here 20, 30 years. It might be time for you to start looking at retirement, bro, because like this, this generation doesn't go for that. We're not doing that here. So sometimes if you don't feel comfortable doing it one-on-one, -on -one, you can talk with some of the other fellas and be like, hey, man, when you know that happened the other day with such and such, what did you think about that? And you'll find there are quite a few that are like, yeah, it didn't really sit right with me either. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that either. Like, man, I went home and told my wife about it. Like, okay, now you got a group of guys and you collectively can go and create change. So sometimes, you know, if, if you're a little more on the timid side, see if you have some allies with you. And then you collectively, like I said, can make change and have a bigger voice 
and going up the ladder versus just you saying, okay, I'm just one person. What can I do? Because they outrank me. You know, so I love it. From that aspect too. I love it. And and just to, you know, one quick note, you know, of course we're coming off of the heels of, um, you know, MLK Day. I know this might be posted on like a different day, right? But um, just thinking about like, you know, the movement that the people can do when they collaborate. Um, it's so interesting how like that's what you basically shared because sometimes we look for, leadership, that one person to like implement this change. But what you just explained is that when a culture, when a group of individuals come together and you say, you know what, it is a lot of isms happening. If we all come together and we just shut it down and say, okay, this is what we expect. This is what we want. And we come together and we fight that fight together. And we have a plan. We have what we expect. We've gotten with HR. We see that their complaint system is broken. However, you guys want to shape it. And then you come together and you, okay, fight about that be no justice, no peace. And you come together. And um, again, you really fight that, that aspect of it. Um, or you really say, you know what, I've noticed that, you know, home girl, homeboy has just been very uh, uh, ism and then uh, ism and they've been practicing this ism. You can really make some changes within the workplace. So I, I hear the conversations all the time. Like I expect them to do it, but the power of we can really transform things. And again, when thinking about, you know, MLK and the marches and all the, the, uh, the collaborative things that happen that required the people and the we to come together, there's a lot of magic that can happen and, and changing the mindset and the culture and um, reshaping a lot of isms and the changes that we have seen in a lot of companies is because of the we. So if more we happen in the workplace, then a lot of they can get up out of there. Okay. Most definitely, because I mean, you got to think about it. If one person goes and challenges an administrator, they could, you know, take the revenge route and try to demote you or not promote you later down the road or even may try to get rid of you. But say if there's 12, 15, 20 men that go and say, look, we need to call a meeting. And it's just all the fellas in there. And they're like, look, the way you're treating the ladies is, is wrong. The way you spoke to such and such is wrong. The comments you made on such and such a tire is wrong. How is that really going to look? They get rid of all of the guys in, in the organization. It's not going to happen. So there, there is power in a collective voice versus a singular voice. You got to think about that. Um, you know, but like I said, in, in situations definitely where it's escalating from words to something physical, you have to do something. You, you absolutely have to do something. I don't care if you're an MMA fighter or if you've never been in a fight in your life. You have to do something, you know, whether it's calling the police, if it's at work, calling HR. Like Aisha spoke about, if you use a diversion tactic, you know, you can do the Fred Sanford fake a heart attack, whatever the case is, you have to do something. Like, you can't just sit by and watch somebody being physically assaulted, you know, especially when it's it's a man assaulting a woman. Like, come on now, we, we weren't raised like that. And if you were, I need you to go and look at my last week episode about mental health and getting therapy, because that's a whole nother conversation. But we, we just can't let that happen, especially in the workplace. Nobody comes to work wanting to be harassed, wanting to be discriminated against, wanting to be talked down and, and talk like they're less than. Like, we, we got to put a stop to that, have to put a stop to that. And for those that are administrators, that's your job. That's not an HR job. That's your job. There's absolutely no excuse for you getting a lawsuit or ending up in a grievance hearing, and that's the first time you're hearing about it. I need you to be getting up from behind your desk, coming down from the 15th floor <laughs> and making some rounds and finding out what's going on with your staff. A grievance hearing or in a courtroom should not be the first time you hear about one of your female employees being harassed or attacked or anything close to that. That, that There's absolutely no excuse for that. Like I, I need a lot of my managers, my supervisors, my administrators to do better. That's, that's not just the HR thing. HR is responsible for the documentation of it. It is your job to make sure that it's not happening and that you're correcting it if it is. I think a lot of people lose sight of that and they just, their hands off and they're like, oh no, HR deal with it. No, that's not HR's job. That's your job. That is your job. All right, before we close up, I want to ask you, um, what are some great strategies that managers and administrators can implement 
to ensure that staff are comfortable coming to them about discrimination and harassment. You know, a lot of people often say, I have an open door policy, I got an open door policy, and people are like, yeah, whatever. I come and talk to you, it goes in one ear, not the other, or I come and talk to you and you're typing on the computer the whole time, you're not even paying attention. You know, so how can people ensure that their staff first are comfortable coming to them and that they truly do have an open door policy? Yeah, one thing that I did, so I did like the like the end of the year episode I did on my podcast, I talked about like things that, you know, leaders should really like look at and pay attention to for 2022. And one of the things I talked about is empathetic leadership. And the first step in empathetic leadership is building relationships because, you know, that is like a buzzword, open door policy. And you have an open door, but you haven't even built any type of relationship with any of your team members. You're not taking time to get to know them. And I know some of them like, okay, I don't, you know, I don't need to know their personal lives. It doesn't need to be their personal lives. It doesn't even have to get into all that. Right. But a, the reality is, is that, you know, the people that you work with, you probably spend just as much, maybe more time with them than you do with most of your friends, your family members, you're seeing them on a daily basis. So it's so important that leaders and managers that have this open door policy, you can't expect people to come in and just divulge what they're seeing, what type of ism that they're navigating if you aren't getting to know them. So empathetic leadership is really merging that aspect of in order to understand and, um, really learn the experiences of your team members, you have to hear their stories and to hear their stories and their different perspectives, you have to get to know them and to get to know them, you have to go stop by, hey, Dan, how you doing today, right? And just start to, again, it's just stopping by and those conversations will evolve. One of the things that I did at one organization that I worked for um, is the commander, right? And the commander is like the CEO of the organization, right? He would have something called coffee with the commander, or you can call it coffee with the CEO. So every month he would randomly choose, or he would actually have his um, either the um, his second in command. He would just randomly choose four team members in the organization, four t- random people. And he will go buy them Starbucks or snacks or whatever. And he will literally sit with them for two hours and just talk. And the beautiful thing is not only was he getting to know those four team members, those team members were getting to know each other. So he wasn't only learning about them, hearing their stories, their perspectives, their backgrounds, right? And even when I do DE and I training, I always talk about getting to know individuals below the surface because we'll, we'll create stories just from the outside, you know? I, I show up and you see me on the outside as a black woman, but you don't know I'm African, right? I'm from West Africa. I'm from Sierra Leone. But to me, like, she's black. She probably from da 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 and she's this. And you're like, she's probably an extrovert. I'm not. I'm an introvert, actually. But if you sat down and you heard my story, you got to understand my background, you would understand, right? Get to learn and understand, like, my story. You're like, oh, man, I had you all wrong. You did, right? Because we create these stories from the external. So that's why it's important for us to get to know the story stories of these individuals. So those two hours, we were getting to know him, he was getting to know us, and we were getting to know each other. So now when I walk by that individual that I barely said, hey, to, hey, it will be like, hey, so how are your kids? Because we just spent two hours together, right? And now the relationship is different. Now, when I see those team members, it's a totally different experience. So I don't know if he even knew that that was what was happening. But we were like, oh, wow, I didn't know that you went to that school. Oh, wow, you have two kids too. Oh, wow, I didn't know you were navigating that. Um, so are you building relationships? So I really have been pushing, um, those leaders and I always ask them, Hey, can you write down at least four unique things about your team members? Can you? So that'll be one of the exercises. And I'm not talking about the stuff that's on their little HR paper that you can look up on their record. I'm like, oh, what is their birthday? No, I need a unique thing. So I can tell you about one of my team members. She has four kids. She's recently married. She got a nice little fat rock on her finger. I'm like, okay, boo, got you a nice little ring. Okay. All right. I tell her she she has this obsession with drinking um diets. It's diet sodas, but it's like she drinks like a hundred of them a day. And I'm not lying. She drinks a lot of them, right? So she drink. I don't know why it keeps her energy up. She drinks a ton of them, right? She loves, loves them high energy. I mean, loves to like, she's super fit. So how do I know all these things by paying attention, watching it, right? Her son looks like a twin looks just like her, but I know about that because I've again paid attention. I have another team member. 
She has a little baby boy. She just had him. He's so cute, right? And she always got good lashes on because I pay attention. So I'm like, oh, she always getting those lashes done. Always has a nice bag, right? Just again, paying attention. I know her family lives in a certain area, right? I have another one. He is really into the creative. Um, he's into the arts. So he's into photography, videography. Um, even when I was recommending what he did as he transitions, I was like, you need to get into public affairs because of this, this, this. I, 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 if I didn't know him, I would have been like, hey, stay in this type of role because of this. That's not even where he's gifted at. He clearly loves doing uh, creative arts and you know, cinematography and so on. I have another team member, me and her are very alike. We're both Sagittarius. She, her birthday is like four or five days apart from me. So the reason why this flows, cause I got to know my team members, right? We meet every Thursday, we talk. I mean, we had a conversation about creating boundaries today. So how are you building relationships with your team members? You can't expect them to come and talk to you about so-and-so harassing them, saying all these different things to them. It's to trust thing. Well, I, if I come in here, do I have a level of trust with you that you are going to support me? You're going to hear me. You're going to, all right, let me close my laptop. What you got? What's going on, Aisha? What's, what's up? Right? I feel more comfortable with you. There's trust there because I know that you have taken time to get to know me. I know there's empathy there. I know there's belonging, belongingness there. I know you support me. Why? Because of the work you have done prior to today to get to know me. So that is the biggest tool. That is the biggest way for you to build that is by building a relationship, by building a relationship that builds trust, that builds empathy within you. Because now when you see them, you don't see Aisha, the black woman, you see Aisha, the mom, you see Aisha, the, 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 you know, whatever other things that come with me, you see the mom, you see the lover of pizza and French fries. You see Aisha that's passionate. You see Aisha that does a hundred things. You see Aisha that has four classes left before she graduate. I'm bragging it about it because about it I ain't know I was going to get here. Eh, eh, eh. You see Aisha that's this and that. So you're not just seeing another employee number four. Mm -hmm. Are you building relationships? Definitely, definitely. You know, and I, to add to that too, one thing, when you have an employee that has come to you um, with a problem, you know, when you finish, uh, well, when they finish, rather, talking to you about said problem, I need you to get in the habit of repeating back to them what happened, because it reassures your staff that you were paying attention to them the whole time. Don't just sit there, you know, arms folded, you lean back in your nice leather chair, and they've been there spilling their guts and all emotional trying to decide if they need to quit or not. And then you're like, all right, I'll get back to you. Like that is the worst thing you can say to someone before they leave out of your office. Actually pay attention, take notes, whether you physically take notes or mentally taking notes. And then before they leave, you know, tell them, okay, so before you leave, I want to make sure I have this correct. You said this, 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 and this. Is that correct? They're like, yeah, you got it. I know you were paying attention. Cool. And then let them know what your next course of action is. At the time, you may not know the full scope of how far it's going to go, but at least let them know what your next step is. That way they know, OK, cool. I can come to such and such and tell them about it. At least I know they're going to do something and they're going to get back with me. Don't just give them. All right, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll holler back at you later. That's not telling me anything. That's not telling me you're going to review you know, the cameras or you're going to pull emails or you're going to actually start interviewing staff. Like, let me let them know what your next course of action is after you repeat it to them, everything that they just reported to you, because the facts are all you have when it comes to investigations, um, especially when you get into discrimination and harassment and things of that nature. So you don't have the ability to sit there and say okay well i think this is what they said or this is what i heard no i need you to be sure before they leave out of your office you know that's part of what i was saying as well with building that trust with your employees they need to know that they are heard and that you were paying attention you're going to actually do something about it so you know i, I just wanted to add that in there because i hear so many people say man i went in there and it was like i was talking to a brick wall they were just looking at me and then they were like, all right, cool. I get back with you. I shouldn't have even went in there. That's not what you want from your employees. That's not an open door policy. It's open, but you might as well 
gorilla glue it because nobody else is going to come through there if, if that's the way you're treating your people. All right. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another fantastic episode. Successes Within Reach podcast, season three, episode three, diversity, inclusion, and equality in the workplace with Miss Aisha Thomas. Uh, we have come to the part of the show where I want to leave you with this week's mind shift moment. Um, And once again, I have another clip for this week's Mind Shift moment, and here it is. In any organization, there are going to be rule changes, structural changes, compensation changes. Change is inevitable. But when change happens, there are two types of people. One are the adjusters. Those are the people that adjust to the change and make the change work for them. The next people are the complainers. These are the people that refuse to change and all they do is sit around and complain, complain, complain. Just complaining itself exudes such negative energy that it's going to affect your productivity and it's not going to help you in any way, shape or form. While the complainers are busy complaining and having a negative attitude, the adjusters are out there figuring out how to make the change work for them. So for example, if it's a change in the compensation plan, The adjusters are out there trying to sell whatever they can in order to make the money versus the complainers are still stuck in their old ways and not willing to budge. In life, it's the adjusters that are successful ultimately at everything that they do because successful people make adjustments. It is necessary for success. So quit whining and complaining about the change and make the change work for you or you can leave the organization. You're always welcome to do that. I absolutely love the way she ended that video. <laughs> she was like, yeah, you're, you're always welcome to leave. Like, <laughs> that is this week's mind shift moment. I think that was absolutely great. You know, unless you own the company, you have to understand change is going to occur. Every single day as an employee, you're dealing with change. Like she said, are you going to whine and complain about it? Or are you going to be an adjuster and adapt and find a way to still succeed within said company? The choice is yours. The choice is yours. All right. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Miss Aisha Thomas, for coming and gracing the show, dropping knowledge and value as always. I want to remind everybody to check her out at Miss Aisha Thomas on Instagram and check out uh, check her out on the web as well at www.aishathomas.org. Um, you can check out her podcast, Leader Set Trends. And also, she has a few books out. I don't know if you guys knew that she was an author, so make sure you go and check those out as well. Uh, anything you want to say before we head out? Yeah, just always leave people with individuals don't typically quit the organization. They typically quit the leader. That's why you need leadership development. So get at your girl, okay? Let's get it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, and as always, please listen, subscribe, and leave a rating, a review. Uh, check us out on Anchor, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio um, as well. Make sure you check us out, follow, subscribe, and like I said, leave us that five-star rating. Once again, my name is Shannon Smith. I am your host, and I'm here to remind you that you were not designed to be good. You were designed to be great. And with that, I say peace, and I will see you next week.